it's been my great privilege to uh, publish three research reports on trust since uh, 2012. Um, and I'm going to speak a little bit about that uh, over the next few minutes. Um, I think uh, one of the things to understand about trustworthy leadership is, is what trust is about. And in the course of this research, uh, we came across this brilliant phrase, which is actually a Dutch saying, which is that um, trust comes on foot uh, <laughs> but leaves on horseback, which just about sums up where we've been you know, for the last six years that you can lose trust very, very uh, quickly. Um, and uh, one of the things to understand about trust, what is it? It's not engagement, it's not an energy. It is very much a relationship between a trustor and a trustee where somebody is prepared to take a risk, something that they see as, as being very uncertain. They're prepared to take a risk uh, and dive off a, a high diving board. They're prepared to make themselves feel uncomfortable, uncertain, fearful, but they'll do so because the person that is asking them to do that, they believe has positive intentions towards them and, and has their safety in mind. So that's quite an important aspect. Four main drivers of trust. I mean, trust is incredibly well researched pre the financial crisis. Four main drivers of, of trust. One is, um, actually the confidence piece, this ability and competence. It, the, trust is not a soft concept, it's a very hard concept in some ways. Uh, do I think this person or this organization has the ability or competence to do their job? Secondly, benevolence. Do I see this individual as being entirely self-seeking or do I see them as bothered about themselves? And thirdly, uh, integrity, which I think it you know, speaks to the themes that we're looking at today, this, this existence of a moral code that people believe in, and fourthly, predictability and um, uh, consistency. So um, one of the phrases I use in the latest report, which we launched a couple of weeks ago, is you can't Twitter your way to trust. <laughs> um, people aren't going to trust you because you've sent a t message down Twitter. They're going to trust you because they've, they've looked at your behavior over a period of time. Um, so, uh, we've been studying 22 different organizations, um, public sector organizations, national government departments, private sector organizations, and so it's been my great luck to work with people like the John Lewis Partnership as exemplars of high trust, um, but also people like BBC Worldwide, Unilever, GKN, uh, and a range, of ABM AMRO is the only bank that would put itself forward mm. to take part, and well done them. Um, and so we've been uh, studying uh, what's been going on for them since the crisis. But, um, and this is quite a challenging point for us, I think, uh, the reason I was asked to do this research was I was researching organizational change and trust before the crisis. And I have to tell everybody here, we had a problem with trust and leadership before the crisis. So I've got hard data that shows across both the public and the private sector, people did not trust senior managers before the crisis. And that's something for us all to reflect on today. It, it's very easy sitting in the city of London to point fingers at you know, financial service companies, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is there were problems pre-crisis. The crisis has only made it worse. It's only exacerbated people's uncertainty about their leaders because of those four dimensions I talked about, ability and competence, benevolence, integrity, and consistency. Uh, but there are some more fundamental issues going on about how senior managers behave. But this is not a Harry Potter Dementor story. Uh, if you read the reports, what was a complete surprise to us in the first report uh, where we examined organizations, all of whom had to implement negative change. They, GKN had to let go of 20% of its workforce worldwide following the crash. Norton Rose, city law firm not far from here, 20% salary cut across the organization for two years. Uh, John Lewis Partnership, very few people know this, implemented its first redundancy program in its history. So there were a number of, all of them were doing negative change. And f about six of them, half a dozen of them, 
implemented this negative change and either maintained or actually raised levels of trust whilst they were doing it. So John Lewis, implementing its first redundancy program ever in its history, raised levels of trust while it was doing it. GKN, letting go of 20% of its workforce, won national engagement awards. I mean, this was completely counterintuitive to what we'd expected. And so the second and third report really uh, speaks to some of what Baron S.J. was talking about. Because in, in the second and third report, we were so surprised by this that we set about trying to understand where had these leaders come from? Were they born and nurtured in mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. and had just got an integrity about them that shone through? been just the most fascinating piece of research and I'll, um, I don't want to sort of uh, um, go on for too long and I'll leave some space for questioning and for Sally's very important piece from a, a, a CEO's perspective. But what, what can I say about it? First of all, there was this attention to trust at all times in these companies. Trust is not something that you can buy from McKinsey. And the companies that did well knew that. And they paid attention to it in the good times and the bad times. And it meant that when they went into the crisis, they had what we call a trust fund. They had trust in the bank. And whilst people in John Lewis said to me, I didn't like the idea of people being made redundant, but I heard the message from Andy Street from a position of high trust in him. So first of all, this is a trust fund. Secondly, is this leadership a service? that all of them had this characteristic that they were there to serve the business or the national government department or the local authority, that this very old-fashioned uh, view that actually it was a privilege to serve and that with that service came responsibility. And thirdly, um, communication, very straight talking, no spin, very little use of corporate PR departments. And if it was bad, they simply told people it was bad. No management jargon, no right-sizing, no downsizing. You're going to lose your jobs. And here is the business data and the business case that we have prepared that shows you why that decision is necessary. Um, relational, very, uh, when you talk to their immediate teams, very concerned about people, very collaborative, mm. um, very good at understanding what their people, what was unique about their teams, what was unique about the individuals they worked with. Um, and at the same time, holding those teams hugely accountable. This is not paternal, because they're very honest with these teams. They share the knowledge uh, that they have about the business. Um, and the result is uh, that they give uh, to these people at the point when they ask them uh, to dive off the diving board, to take this risk. Uh, they have inculcated into their teams and their organisations a sense of safety, a sense of inclusion, that you are all in this together, and also an enormous sense of pride. So people have a pride in these organisations and working for these leaders. And there's, there's much more that I can say, except one thing, they weren't superheroes. Mm. All of them were flawed, all of them were human and all of them were very vulnerable and they shared that vulnerability. So it's a very different kind of leadership from the superhero, astronaut sort of thing. Thank you, Thank you very much.